It's 2022 and there is still a winter Olympic sport women can't compete in. The girls on the circuit are absolutely crushing it. But an athlete from Steamboat Springs hasn't given up hope on her chance at gold. Your XL energy bill could be going up and state regulators are upset they had to give the green light to let it happen. If positivity rates don't tell us how much COVID is truly in our community, then what does and what are we risking in the meantime? And we are back tonight talking once again about an issue with ballots and which election needs some extra people keeping an eye on it. That's next. Another county is revealing that it misprinted ballots for certain races for the June 28th primary. Pueblo County now joining Denver with errors in printing correct ballots. This time, the Colorado Secretary of State appointed someone to help oversee Pueblo's elections on Tuesday. Politics guy Marshall Zollinger is back again with what happened, how it was discovered, and what's next. There are issues with ballots in Pueblo. Some voters receive ballots with the wrong race. Other voters got sent ballots with a county commissioner's race missing. Good thing Elvis was in the building. Because I just love politics, and I know some people don't like politics. is a bad word to some people. Pueblo resident Elvis Martinez caught one of the mistakes. He was one of 20 voters sent a ballot with a candidate for House District 62 listed on it. It should have been House District 46, a contested race between two candidates. Even though with the redistricting, I knew that I was still in House District 46 and not 62. Voters in another part of Pueblo West may also have been sent ballots with an incorrect race. That is still being investigated. These problems are similar to what we reported yesterday. 60 voters in Denver were also sent a ballot with an incorrect race. An error, not fraud. Both caught by voters. No, it is not election fraud. It's a mistake as well. County Clerk's Association Director Matt Crane points out mistakes like these happen every 10 years when political maps get redrawn because of redistricting. In elections that follow redistricting, we tend to see one or two of these types of issues pop up across the state where there will be an issue in the way that a district is set up. Um, and an incorrect ballot style uh, may be issued, and I think that's what we're seeing in both Pueblo and Denver. In Pueblo, another problem. 1,600 ballots were printed missing the race for County Commissioner District 3. Of those 1,600, 498 of them should have been printed with this Democratic race between two candidates. There is only one candidate on the Republican side. Colorado's Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold received a half dozen complaints about the Pueblo ballot issues. She announced Wednesday night that she was ordering someone to help Democratic Pueblo clerk Bo Ortiz to oversee Tuesday's election. It's similar to how Republican Elbert County clerk Dallas Schroeder also has a shadow helping him on Tuesday, but it's not like Mesa County, where Republican clerk Tina Peters is not allowed to participate because of her efforts to undermine election integrity. I want to be clear on the difference. Peters is accused of tampering with election equipment and a judge has barred her from overseeing elections this year. Griswold has appointed someone to oversee both Elbert and Pueblo's clerks. Those clerks can still run the election just with someone over their shoulder and uh, they can, those people who are over their shoulders could stop if something seems funny or report back to the Secretary of State. So how is it possible that that many ballots are printed without a race? Right, 1,600 without that county commissioner's race. Apparently the county, Pueblo County, caught it before the printer was gonna print the ballots and they sent a new, here's what the ballot should look like when you print it, and apparently the printer used the old version oh. for a portion of the ballots they printed. So okay. just 1% of voters in Pueblo County, but 1% still 1%. All right. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate it, Marshall. Well, how far reaching is the Supreme Court ruling to strike down a New York state gun law going to be? We're asking because Denver has a newer concealed carry law. And while it won't have an immediate impact, it could be opening the door to a more expansive view of what rights people do have under the Second Amendment. The case concerned a law in New York governing licenses to carry concealed handguns in public for self-defense. It required a New Yorker to get a license and then demonstrate a real reason for needing to carry it in public. They had to show what they had 
a special or unique danger to their life. Now, the majority conservative court struck down that law in a six to three ruling today, saying that it violated people's Second Amendment rights. The opinion is changing the framework that lower courts will use going forward as they're analyzing other gun restrictions. We decided to talk to Christopher Jackson, a constitutional law attorney, to figure out how this could be impacting local gun laws, including the one banning concealed carry in Denver City buildings and parks. So this ordinance is covering any building or a part of a building owned or leased by the city as well as the city parks. It does have some carve outs here like for law enforcement, security guards, people doing legitimate sporting activities with a gun. It passed Denver City Council in a nine to three vote just last month. So Jackson says that the ruling today doesn't actually directly cover a law like Denver's, but a critical question would be if a court would consider parks to be a sensitive place like schools or government buildings or large sporting events, movie theaters. If the court decides no, there is a chance that the new law could go away. The city attorney's office said that they are currently going over the Supreme Court's decision. If you are like so many people, myself included, you're looking at the state positivity rate for COVID to gauge just how much COVID is swirling around in our community and what do you do about it? But we also know that this isn't really the full picture, especially with so many of us testing at home, not always reporting it to the state. So what are we really at risk for right now? And I think the problem with just looking at the positivity rate is that we don't get a full story of all of the people out there who might be sick. But with vaccines, a generally milder variant that's circulating right now, how much of a difference does this really make? Dr. Mark Montano with Health One said even though COVID can be a lot less scary now than it was two and a half years ago, we really haven't reached a point yet to truly treat it like other viruses. We, we track influenza yearly and, and we follow uh, the um, mortality of that. And it's anywhere from about 25,000 to 75,000 a year who die from influenza. So even as mild as influenza is compared to COVID, we still track that. Uh, right now, our COVID deaths are about 10 times as high. All right, so back to the original question. How are you supposed to gauge your risk? Well, you have to look through a couple of tabs of state data, including hospitalizations, the case counts, the testing numbers. That's along with positivity, which is sitting just above 11% over the last week. So at this point, it's not really just about if we are above or below that 5% threshold to trigger your COVID precautions. Health experts say you have to look at it holistically and then use your common sense about your risk. Also, while the raw numbers for positive Positivity might be a lot higher than what we're seeing here. Also keep in mind less people are testing and among those who are testing, it's more people who are already sick versus those who are asymptomatic. All of this is impacting the numbers. A recall petition of the top prosecutor in the San Luis Valley will be allowed to go forward. The Secretary of State's office announced today that the petition to recall District Attorney Alonzo Payne does have enough valid signatures. The AG's office said that they are also still investigating allegations for violating Victims' Rights Acts. That includes allegations that Payne and his staff had yelled at crime victims in February, showed up late to meetings with them, didn't follow up with crime victims as required by law. We did reach out to Payne office late today. This was right after we received this update and haven't heard back yet. Colorado's newest transplants will soon be arriving from places like Wyoming and Idaho and Montana. They won't be getting here until at least 2024, but the plans to reintroduce wolves back into our state that has already started. And even as ranchers who are wary of these wolves are asking the state to stop the plan, Mark Salinger is showing us that the voters have already spoken. Colorado's decision to reintroduce wolves back to the state started here at the ballot box. Its impact will be felt in places like way out here. Wolves will be captured from states like Idaho, Montana and Wyoming before they're brought to Colorado and reintroduced to the state. Colorado Parks and Wildlife is required to release them west of the Continental Divide. They're very agile, very, very mobile animals. And so um, we will reintroduce a, a fair distance south of Wyoming, east from Utah and north from New Mexico. Eric O'Dell is a species and conservation and program manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So, the plan is to bring in between 10 to 15 animals per year over a three year span. So around 30 to 50 animals that would be monitored once they're in the state. Ultimately, that's what we want to do is establish a, a population that 
that takes care of itself and that does not need ongoing reintroduction of, of additional animals. A pack of wolves naturally migrated down from Wyoming recently and is responsible for several cows that were killed on a ranch near Walden. No wolves have been reintroduced by humans yet. Back in November of 2020, voters passed a statute to begin the process of bringing wolves back to Colorado. Parks and Wildlife has been working since then to create a plan to do so. That has to be completed by December 31st of 2023, before the Parks and Wildlife Commission approves it. You know, we want animals that are going to do well. We don't want to take animals that have a history of depredation. It's an expensive process, trapping wolves using a helicopter and transporting them to Colorado. Parks and Wildlife is already budgeting for the depredation costs the state will have to pay out to ranchers for livestock killed by wolves. Now, Colorado voters chose to develop a self-sustaining population of wolves in the state. That's what this statute said that was passed. So while there is this pack of wolves that's migrated down from Wyoming all by itself and is living in North Park near Walden, that pack is not enough to sustain the wolf population around the state. Colorado Parks and Wildlife is required to keep moving forward until the will of the voters is fulfilled and wolves are fully introduced, Anusha. Yeah, this will not be the first or last time that we are talking about this issue. Thanks Absolutely. so much, Mark. Excel is going to be able to pass off around $500 million to customers for very expensive natural gas last year. State regulators are warning this better not happen again. The one thing that every athlete dreams about is the Olympics. Could that dream be opening up for more women, including skiers here in Colorado? And exactly how do they get those ads on the ice at Avs games? Well, we are all about answering your unique Stanley Cup questions next. XL energy bills are going up again, a move that was approved by state regulators who really wish they did not have to okay it. The Public Utilities Commission will allow XL to recover hundreds of millions of dollars from customers because of out of this world natural gas prices over President's Day weekend last year. So what this means is customers will be paying more than $500 million to cover the cost of gas over those four days. Company meteorologists did not anticipate the extreme temps, but then the storm got closer, the forecast changed, and then several Colorado energy companies, including Excel, found themselves buying natural gas that was upwards of 100 times the normal price. During yesterday's ruling, Commissioner Megan Gilman said that she was very troubled and had wished Excel was more serious about telling people to conserve ahead of that cold snap, but then also admitted that the company couldn't possibly have predicted just how high the cost of natural gas would spike. I think it's really predicated on this being unprecedented and then having no idea um, ha how high prices could go and would just note that that only works this time. Right now, um, the company is on notice. We're all on notice that this certainly could happen again. And so um, any future occurrences would be viewed very differently. So a breakdown of how much this will actually cost. It's going to be just less than $1.50 a month for more than two years for the average residential electric customer. It'll be just less than $5.60 a month for three years for the average residential gas customer. The heat was on, plus a few storms up in the high country, kind of looking at some darker skies in and around the foothills just to the west of Fort Collins. Really haven't seen much in the way of rain here for the metro area. Maybe one or two isolated little gusty showers passing by. Otherwise, we're looking pretty good. Downtown Denver with a little bit of blue in the far off distance. Today marks day 11 in the 90s so far this season. 100 degrees in Ray. We were in the mid 90s around far southeastern Colorado. Some 70s and 80s up into the mountains, but cooler weather of course is on the way just in time for the weekend. Most of the thunderstorms have been west of the Continental Divide. You can see in and around parts of Jackson through Grand County, some nice rain showers coming through a little bit of lightning, but it has been pretty quiet here in the metro area. Overnight, we stay dry. We'll be looking at partly cloudy skies overnight, and that's the way we kick off your Friday 8 a.m. by about one o'clock. So just after 
after lunchtime or getting ready for the as game, you might find a few isolated showers here in Denver. Six o'clock when the puck drops, a couple of quick showers. Again, nothing severe here in the metro area and things push off to the northeast pretty fast. As we look ahead toward the weekend, we will once again be tapping back into that monsoon flow. So that means a good chance for seeing some rain around here. Tomorrow is still pretty toasty with 90s across much of eastern Colorado. But look what's coming our way for the weekend. A cold front that digs into eastern Colorado and that is going to drop off our temperatures dramatically into the 70s Saturday and Sunday with a good chance of storms. But you know the drill. The 90s are back next week. Tonight's next question comes to us from Teresa. She's been watching the Stanley Cup and noticed the on ice ads change a lot and wanted to know exactly how that works. It's a really interesting question, Teresa. And as we found out, the ice is made over a concrete floor. So there are 13 miles of pipe underneath it that carries the coolant that freezes the concrete and the water that gets put on top of it to make the ice. The ads told us there are three options here. Some of the ads you see are painted on the ice with a special ice paint and stencil. Then the ice is built on top of the paint one layer at a time until there's an inch of ice over it. Others are cloth logos printed and laid out on the ice and then covered in that similar way and then some of the logos that you see on TV are superimposed digitally. It's a great question. We want to hear some more. You can record a video or an audio message of yourself asking the question. Email us at next at 9 newscom and we'll get to work on answering that question for you and anyone else who's wondering the same thing. At this point, if they were trying to exclude us from competitions, like it, it would just be an excuse. A Steamboat spring skier is tired of the excuses. She's waiting for a decision from the IOC for a chance to live out her Olympic dreams. Next. An athlete from Steamboat Springs is hoping to compete for her country in the Winter Olympics in 2026. The problem is that she's hoping to compete in one of the oldest events that still doesn't allow women. She explains the why she is holding out hope as the International Olympic Committee is meeting this weekend. On the ball. Once I took that ski jump, let go of the bar and like sent it down, I was, I was hooked. My name is Annika Malasinski and I am from Steamboat Springs, Colorado. I am currently in Slovenia. This is a great place to train. My coach is kicking my ass right now, so. <laughs> I do Nordic Combine, which is ski jumping and cross country skiing. So what makes the sport super interesting is that it's not just like one sport that you're training for, you're training for two. One thing that every athlete dreams about is the Olympics. I think the biggest like um, factors as why they haven't put it in the Olympics yet is because we're still like a progressing sport. Like it has been, but I don't think people understand how far along our sport has come. I think we are absolutely at a level where we could be at the Olympics and like crush it. At this point, it's just excuses if they're not going to put put us in. It's Annika Malasinski. I think it would be a win for everyone, and I think it's a step closer to a more fair world to show that like girls can do it too. It would be kind of a dream come true and I feel like I would definitely have a shot. Annika is expecting that we will know what the IOC decides by Sunday. We've got your feedback coming up next. All right. We got feedback from Janet saying, what's with the hands needing to be flailing around when she's giving stories? Good grief. That is extremely annoying and distracting. Please sit on your hands. Well, that feels like an even more awkward way to do the show, show Janet. But thanks for writing in. We'll see you next time.